have one image, for example, this is a pretty typical example, I would say, in terms of what a photo looks like right out of the camera, what a photo looks like when I'm getting ready to start processing the image. Uh, obviously, the subject matter will vary tremendously in some cases, but the idea is that I have an image that seems to be reasonably well exposed, that I personally think has a pretty good composition, and the color seems pretty good. At first glance, not, a, not any significant problems, no real challenges with this photo. And so it's tempting, I think, to just jump into your sort of robotic workflow. I set the white point, I set the black point, I kick up a little clarity, give it a little vibrance, and I move on. And instead, I really encourage you to spend some time looking at the photo, evaluating the photo, considering. Not that we want to spend hours and hours optimizing our photos, but we want to make sure that we're not being robotic, that we're being methodical and thoughtful, but we're also thinking creatively about the photo itself. Why did we take the picture? What is it that we like about the picture, etc.? So let's consider this image. It's a pretty straightforward example. It's actually a very typical example for me insofar as the image comes out of the camera, needs a little bit of refinement, but there's nothing dramatic that I feel that I need to do to the image. It wasn't dramatically underexposed, the color temperature isn't wildly off, etc. And so here we have, why did I take this picture? Well, it's a pretty nice looking tree. Uh, I like this tree. It was photographed out in the Palouse region of eastern Washington state every year for, well, it's going close to 10 years now. I've been leading photo workshops out in the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. And trees are hard to come by out there. So whenever we find a tree, it's always a, an exciting moment, especially some of these really wonderful lone trees that are out in the middle of these rolling hills. And we've got, of course, crops surrounding. And so part of the motivation here is just, look, it's a lone tree in the middle of a farm field in the Palouse. It's, uh, it's a bit unique. Many others might say it's just a tree, but in this case, that's actually uh, somewhat special, you might say. So pretty straightforward. I want to emphasize detail. Notice that I got down low. I included the wheat in the foreground. I'm trying to provide a sense of context that this isn't just a field on a hillside, but it's actually in the middle of a wheat field. And it's been left there rather than cutting it down to make way for a little bit more wheat it's allowed to continue growing, obviously, for more than a few years. Nice clouds in the background. And so just trying to consider what are the things that I like about this photo? Why did I get down low to include the wheat? That would be mostly about the texture in this case and a little bit about the color. And why did I choose this particular day to go out to this tree? It was in large part because of the nice clouds that we've got in the sky. And so considering what is it that I like and what do I not like, some of you may already have noticed one of the things I don't like is that there are some dust spots. This is one of the ongoing challenges out in the Palouse. During these workshops, I think at least a couple times a week, I was cleaning the sensor on my camera because it is very dusty out there. So you can see up here above and to the left of the tree, we'll get a few dust spots up in the sky. We'll take care of those shortly. So again, just trying to think about what is it about this photo that I like? What do I want to emphasize and what might I want to de-emphasize? A pretty straightforward situation in this case, I'll go ahead and hide our panels here, the top and bottom panels, so we can see a little more of that image. And I'm going to start off, as I always do, with my basic adjustments, and more specifically, I'm going to start off with my tonal adjustments. Generally speaking, I want to maximize tonality. I want the brightest area of the image to be white, the darkest area to be black, and then I can make a decision about detail in between. It's important to keep in mind that that does not mean that for every single photo I'm going to maximize the white point. It doesn't mean that for every single photo I'm going to minimize the black point. It just means that that's a pretty good starting point overall. And so fairly straightforward. I want to see where I'm losing details when I'm increasing the value for whites. Obviously, if I go all the way up, I know that I'm losing detail. Where and to what extent? To figure that out, I'll use the clipping previews. So I'll hold the Alt key on Windows, Option key on Macintosh increase the value for whites until I start to see pixels appearing. That is where I'm losing detail on one or more channels. White indicates that I'm losing detail on all of the channels, blowing out to a pure white. So the general idea is that I'll increase until I see pixels and then back off, move back to the left until those pixels just about all disappear. So I've established that white point. Same basic process for the black point, holding the Alt or Option key on the keyboard, getting that clipping preview reducing the value for blacks until I see pixels showing up, and then bring that back to the right until the point, generally speaking, until the point right where those pixels disappear.
at this point I can start thinking about overall detail in the photo. And I have a tendency to kind of bounce around a little bit. I go to the whites first and the blacks and then generally highlight shadows. But I also want to think about clarity if I want to boost some of the detail in the photo. And so I might bounce back and forth a little bit, maybe go to clarity first. But the idea is that I can move around back and forth. It doesn't matter what order I'm applying these adjustments in. Lightroom has its own order behind the scenes. I don't get to find out what that order is, and I don't need to worry about it. But I can apply those adjustments in any order that I want, keeping in mind that Lightroom in the develop module is always non-destructive. It's not actually altering the original pixel values for my photo. So in this case, since the detail is kind of so important to me and I really want to kick up that detail a little bit, there are two things that are going to be sort of on equal footing. One is to increase clarity a little bit. I'll crank that up extensively to an exaggerated level. You can see I'm getting a little bit more mid-tone contrast. Well, at this point, a lot more mid-tone contrast. Accentuating the texture in the foreground, that's good, but a little bit too much in this case. And starting to become a problem for the tree. And this is part of why I'll sometimes come down to clarity first. When I know I'm going to want to boost clarity for the image, I've now darkened up the shadows, so I need to compensate a little with more of a shadows adjustment. But in this case, I don't need, obviously, quite as much clarity. Maybe somewhere around there looks to be pretty good. Just boosting that detail in the foreground just a little bit. I'll press the backslash key here so that we can see the before version of the image and then after. So we're just boosting those details a little bit. But I want more detail in the highlights as well. So I've got some cloud detail back there. I set a white point. I've got some pretty bright areas in the clouds. And if you watch those clouds, as I darken down the highlights, you see that I get a little more perceived detail in those cloud areas. So I'll darken down those highlights a fair amount in this case. Keep in mind, by the way, that when I reduce the value for highlights, not only am I darkening the highlights, the bright areas of the photo, I'm also enhancing contrast, essentially like adding clarity into those highlight areas. Shadows, same concept. I can brighten or darken the shadows. And when I brighten the shadows, I am also getting a little bit of that clarity boost as well for the shadow areas. So that's looking a little bit closer. Maybe I'll give it just a little more boost of clarity. Something like that I think is looking pretty good for the image in terms of overall tonality. Then I can turn my attention to the color. First and foremost, making sure that overall white balance is accurate. Because I shoot raw almost exclusively, I also almost exclusively leave the camera set to auto white balance. There are certainly circumstances where I use a custom white balance or a particular preset, but for my sort of normal everyday photography, you might say, I'm just using auto white balance in large part because there's not much advantage from my personal workflow to using a custom white balance or a preset in the camera because I'm a control freak. I'm always going to come tinker with my temperature and tint sliders anyway. And so if I had set the, the camera to, let's say, daylight, for example, it's a sunny day, daylight, eh, that's not very warm. It's a little bit too cool for my, for my eye. And so if I had the camera set the way I think I would have wanted it, that wouldn't have worked out so well. So I just leave the camera set to auto white balance. Again, there are certainly reasons that you might want to use a custom white balance, and especially in certain circumstances. There there are some potential workflow advantages depending on your specific type of photography. But for me, I'm always going to play with those sliders anyway. So I just leave the camera to auto, and then the white balance here, the pop-up, I just leave to uh, as shot. I don't use the eyedropper because that turns into a clicking battle of trying to find the right pixel to click on to produce the right color in the image. So instead, I just go directly to my sliders. And in this case, it was a bright sunny day. I want to try to preserve that warmth in the image. So I'm going to go little bit to a warmer value perhaps than I started with. I'm not sure how easily you can necessarily see this through the broadcast here, but there is a bit of magenta, especially up in the sky. Now bear in mind, if I'm trying to compensate for magenta, I'm shifting toward green. That means I'm going to get more green in the leaves of the tree and the wheat in the foreground. So sort of a double win there, maybe somewhere in that general vicinity looks to be pretty good. Keep in mind, by the way, if you're having a difficult time with the mouse, can't get quite the right value that you're looking for with that slider, you can always click into the numeric value for any slider and then use the up arrow on the keyboard to increase that value, down arrow on the keyboard to decrease the value, and you can hold the shift key along with the up and down arrow key to adjust in larger increments if you'd like. So I'll leave that set to right about there. Let's take that magenta down a little further, maybe right about there. 
you, you get the idea though. We're able to fine tune that overall color balance, that white balance, or color temperature adjustment for the image, trying to get the colors as accurate as possible. And accurate, if you could see me now, there are air quotes, because you know accuracy, especially for fine art photography and even to some extent nature photography, there's sort of this range of reality, you might say, what was the most accurate view for this scene? What did this scene really look like? Was it this warm? Was it this cool? It certainly wasn't this one, go all the way to the extreme value. It certainly wasn't this cool. That'd be more like a moonlit night. But the point is that we've got a little bit of a range of acceptable values and we can interpret that. I'm not trying to make noon look like golden hour, but I do have a little bit of a artistic license, you might say in terms of maybe bumping up the warmth a little bit for some images, cooling down other images. And then one of my favorite adjustments is vibrance, so boosting those colors. So there's some nice color here. I've got nice color in the sky. I've got nice color in the wheat. Part of the reason that I go to the Palouse region in June every year is that we have the spring wheat is still looking nice and green, and the winter wheat is just starting to get a little bit golden. And so I want those colors. I'm part of the reason that I took this picture is that the color was very nice. I certainly want to boost that just a little bit. So I'll take that vibrance up. Now, of course, I want to push those colors, but I don't want to go overboard. Vibrance, because it has this variable effect, because it's applying a stronger adjustment to the colors that are not very saturated, while not pushing the colors that are saturated, we can push that vibrant slider pretty far and get away with it, but we want to be careful not to take things too far. And so just a little bit of a boost to try to get those colors looking a little more the way I remember them looking. Having boosted those colors, I see here still got a little bit too much magenta in the image, so maybe right about there works a little bit better. And that's bringing out a little too much of the yellow. So again, notice this constant kind of back and forth. Every time I'm making an adjustment, it's having some other impact on the overall image. And so I want to be thoughtful about that. I want to pay attention to the image and I want to continue working this image. And basically at any given moment, I'm trying to sort of think to myself, okay, how is this doing compared to what got me so excited that I wanted to take the picture in the first place? I, the tree was great, the color was good, the light was good, the, sh the clouds in the sky are nice. And so what is it that this is lacking? What is not quite rising up to the level that I'm looking for in terms of you know, what it was that caught my eye. Um, and I should, oh, I see there was a question. Uh, Renee, you've got a question from uh, one of the attendees? Yes, Robert asked, is this image raw or jaded? Great question, I have to double check. It is a raw capture. Uh, although actually there is another obvious clue without having to look at the image. I, the reason I have to check is because I do very often work with JPEG images when I'm just uh, demonstrating techniques just to kind of help streamline things. And uh, the other clue, just as a little aside, is that the temperature control and the tint control, well, the temperature specifically, notice that it shows me a Kelvin scale. And so that is for a raw. If this were a JPEG, then I don't get Kelvin. I just get a numeric value, so it starts at zero. And so that is one clue. Uh, but then, Renee, you have a follow-up question? Yes, Lori asked, how much optimization is possible with a JPEG image versus a RAW? Quite a lot. So, the, you know, is there a huge advantage to RAW versus JPEG? And I would say, uh, it's a tricky question. In the context of working in Lightroom's develop module, you can work with both RAW and JPEG. You've got all the same adjustments available. So there are two key advantages to RAW capture as compared to JPEG. Number one, is that we have high bit data to work with. So we've got a greater overall total tonal range, greater dynamic range, greater detail, and that can be a, an advantage, certainly. The bigger issue, quite frankly, is that JPEG images always have lossy compression applied, which means there's always a risk that the artifacts from that compression might be visible in the image, especially if you need to apply strong adjustments. And especially in smoother areas, it tends to be a little more obvious. So the sky as opposed to the wheat. In the wheat, if there were some JPEG artifacts, those probably would not be very problematic because there's just lots of sort of chaotic texture going on there anyway. How are we going to notice any JPEG artifacts? Whereas in the sky, we might see a little bit of a grid pattern because of the way JPEG compression works. If your exposure is great and your color temperature is great right out of the camera, quite honestly, 
the disadvantages of JPEG capture are relatively modest, but that JPEG compression issue is one that just keeps me away from JPEG capture under normal circumstances. And then we have uh, one more question about the uh, white point and the black point. Yes. Do you ever use the shift click on white to automatically find the white point and the black point? Uh, so the automatic approach to setting whites and blacks. No, I don't. And the reason, so I'm using the alter option key so that I can get that clipping preview. And the reason is because I'm not always making exactly the same decision. And so, for example, I'm not sure how easily you can see the tiny little pixels there, but I've got some red channel pixels that are clipping. I might want to stop there before going on to the whites, or I might want, if I have specular highlights, to push the whites. Even more so for the blacks, I might want to silhouette to darken up to block some of that shadow detail. And so I use that alter option key on the keyboard to get the clipping preview, mostly just to have a little bit more control that I can exercise over the image. So that gives us kind of that basic, very typical workflow. In this case, I also obviously have those dust spots that we talked about earlier. Now what do I do about that? In concept, I might send the photo to Photoshop. We'll talk more about that a little bit later today. But when it's very basic, you can see that my dust spots up in the sky, I'll go ahead and zoom in there, and we can see that the dust spots up in the sky are not especially problematic. They're over the sky and in the clouds. It's going to be pretty easy to blend those away. So this is a situation where the spot removal tool in Lightroom does a perfectly adequate job. I'll make sure that I'm on the heel option, and then I can come out into the image and use the left and right square bracket keys on the keyboard to adjust my brush size, left square bracket key to reduce the size, right square bracket key to increase the size, and then just click on the spot. I'll move my mouse off the image so that those indicators will go away, and you can see cleaned up just fine. Go ahead and paint the little street there. I'm not limited to just circles. I don't have to just click and release. I can click and drag to draw, in this case, uh, let's call that an arc, and then my cleanup area will be exactly the same shape. So I can go through, obviously, and clean up all of those dust spots. I've had some others. Oh, let's see, there's one over here. I'll go ahead and turn on visualize spots, in fact, and you can see a little more clearly. So on the toolbar down below the image, when I'm working with that spot removal tool, turn on the checkbox for visualize spots, drag the slider through the various settings here. Usually way over to the right works best, but that's not true for every single image. And while I have that option enabled, I can clean up some of those other spots that I'm finding. Just be sure to go back and turn off visualize spots and kind of check to make sure that what you're getting rid of really is a dust spot. There's another one right there, etc. You get the idea. We're able to clean up those spots. But if it was anything more complicated, then I would be thinking about Photoshop. Now, there are some other adjustments I might apply. We'll save some of those for some other images that we'll work with. Let's go ahead and move on to another photo here. And same basic concept. So now, again, thinking about why did I capture this image? I was fortunate to find this wonderful English garden. I found this subject, pink or magenta, set against green, complementary colors. That's pretty nice. I happened to be there. Well, happened to be there. I chose to be there the morning after an evening of rain, so we had lots of nice rain. Actual legitimate raindrops. We didn't even have to water the garden to get water droplets on our flowers. That was a nice added touch. And then I was also working with a lens that opens up to an aperture of f1.8, so I was able to get some nice narrow depth of field. And I like, personally, close-up photography with narrow depth of field. I know with macro and close-up, we're always struggling to try to get as much depth of field as possible. I actually really tend to like narrow depth of field for a variety of situations, including close-up. It's just, it's more dramatic. It feels to me a little bit more intimate. And so how do I emphasize those details? Love the water droplets, the texture there, uh, both on the tops of the petals here, on the stem over to the left, as well as underneath the petals here and definitely emphasize the color. And also, I think I was being a little bit conservative here. You'll notice my exposure did not cause any details to be lost in the shadows, but I left a whole lot of room over toward the right. This is not actually an optimal exposure, so I need to fix that as quickly as possible so that no one will ever know that I underexposed this image, probably by oh, close to a full stop of underexposure. Not exactly what I was aiming for. So please don't tell anyone else that I underexposed an image by so much. But this is an example. Notice when I was working with the tonality on the previous image, I went to my whites and the blacks, clarity, highlights, shadows. I just pretended like exposure and contrast didn't even exist. 
Well, in actual fact, contrast I pretty much always leave alone because I can use a tone curve for contrast or I can darken up my highlights and brighten up the shadows. Oh, take that the other way. I can darken up the highlights and brighten up the shadows, darken up the shadows, brighten up the highlights, either direction, frankly, and I can adjust my overall contrast, whether I'm trying to increase contrast with brighter highlights and darker shadows or decrease contrast with darker highlights, brighter shadows. Hopefully I got all those tongue twisters put out in the right order. But you get the point. Contrast I can adjust in other ways. Exposure, however, that's a slider I leave alone if the exposure was good out of the camera. Here, I would say not a good exposure out of the camera. Still acceptable, still going to be fine, but I wish I had exposed at least a half stop brighter, maybe two-thirds of a stop brighter. We'll find out in just a moment. Now, the exposure slider does have a clipping preview. And so I could hold the alter option key and adjust that exposure. But frankly, I generally don't. I just go visually. I am making sure, of course, that my display is calibrated so that I'm getting an accurate view of my monitor display. And then I adjust my overall exposure. And I think right about there. So roughly two thirds of a stop of, let's call this after the capture exposure compensation that uh, I will apply here. And so that's brightening up the overall. Am I clipping highlights? I don't know. I'm not really worried about it. If there were anything significant, I'll discover that next with the white point. And so I'm just using this exposure adjustment to fix what should have been fixed in the camera. I'm doing that visually. Yes, of course, in the camera, I might have used a histogram. Well, in this case, should have used a histogram and I might have had a better exposure right from the start, but I'm just compensating visually and we'll get that more kind of technical evaluation of the final effect in just a moment. But first, yeah. we've got uh, another question it? from an attendee. Yes, Renee. Yes, Lori asks, is it possible to clone out a large object such as the stem on the left? Hopefully that's a hypothetical because I actually like the stem over on the left hand side. Otherwise, full disclosure, I might have actually just used my fingers and pulled it over toward the left out of the frame while I took the picture of the flower. Could you get rid of it? Yes. Could you do that in Lightroom? No. That would be a job for Photoshop. Lightroom's cleanup capabilities just are not that sophisticated. It's lacking, for example, the content aware technology that's included in Photoshop. So I've set that overall exposure and now I can adjust the other settings. Uh, but first I had mentioned the preview capability, the backslash capability. Renee, there's a question about the, uh, the preview. Yeah, D asks, does the backslash key uh, show the original image or just yeah, the image before the previous step was applied? Yeah, so is that backslash taking us all the way back to the very beginning out of the camera? Sort of, but not quite. So it's, it is not a preview going back to the previous adjustment. What it's actually going to is the version of the image as it looked when you imported it into Lightroom. So what does that normally mean for a normal photographer? Well, when you import an image into Lightroom, it's probably essentially straight out of the camera. So backslash in the develop module, that keyboard shortcut takes you back to the original version of the image. I get caught with a little problem here, so to speak, a little challenge because of all these different presentations I'm doing, I make a custom Lightroom catalog for a specific presentation. So in this case, sometimes you'll notice that I get tripped up going to the preview, the before version of the image. Here's the before version. It's actually the after version because this is what I imported into Lightroom and then I reset the adjustments back to their Lightroom defaults. So under normal circumstances, when you import an image into Lightroom, it's going to be the image as it came out of the camera. Therefore, backslash takes you back to the original image before any adjustments were applied. I have a special situation here because I'm not a normal photographer and I've imported some images into a custom Lightroom catalog that already had some adjustments applied. So a little bit of a special challenge for me, but under normal circumstances, you won't have to deal with that challenge. All right, so I've gotten that exposure up. So that's essentially brought me back to the same baseline where I was with the previous image. And so now I can go back in and adjust my white points. I'm just holding the alt or option key, bring that white point up. And in this case, needing to brighten up the black point just a little bit, darken down those highlights, get a little bit of a clarity boost there, a little bit of a boost in the overall vibrance so that I'm bringing up the colors that need it the most without creating problems for the already highly saturated colors. 
little bit too much yellow for my taste in the background there. And so I'll bring that temperature back over toward the, the left, toward the cooler tones, a blue tone. And then just a teeny tiny little adjustment for tint. And that's getting us much closer to that final effect. Again, when I initially started with this image, thinking about why did I take the picture? The color's nice, the water droplets are nice, the overall contrast, the textures, etc. And so trying to emphasize those things. One of the big questions I always struggle with is shadow detail. This is my own little struggle. Perhaps as a photographer, you don't struggle with this as much as I do. But oftentimes I like to darken the shadows to get a little bit more drama. But then I feel like maybe I want to bring out some more of the details. So in this case, I would probably, I like a little more drama. I would probably darken down those shadows. I could always go in and brighten up just the central area of the flower there if I wanted to brighten up just this interior portion, for example. I could come in and grab my adjustment brush. I'll go ahead and make an extreme exposure adjustment uh, just to kind of exaggerate the effect. Cut this brush just a little bit more. And I'll come in here and create this ridiculous, absurd overexposure of that area. You can see that I can paint in a little bit of a brightening effect for that area if I wanted to. So I do have more flexibility. More often than not, I'm just kind of trying to make a decision about what degree of detail do I want to present versus kind of leaving alone, as it were. Now, interestingly enough, in a lot of cases, you know, that same basic workflow over and over again really makes a lot of sense. I will go on to some of the other adjustments, of course. We're not just going to stick into the basic uh, set of adjustments, but I do want to emphasize that more often than not, at least in theory, most of my images, the images that I'm really happy with, they came out of the camera looking reasonably good. And so it's just a matter of fine tuning, not of trying to compensate for huge mistakes I made out in the field. And so while there are other adjustments I want to apply, and we'll talk about some of those, I do want to generally emphasize the basic adjustments. And that's where I spend most of my time. It's just kind of interpreting the photo as it were. And it really starts to become rather easy I think if you're kind of thinking about those issues in the photo, what are you really trying to accomplish? How much drama versus detail versus other attributes? But then trying to think about, you know, trying to make sure that you don't fall into that trap, as I mentioned earlier, of just kind of always doing the same thing. So I hold the Alt key or Option key, increase the value for the whites, and then I do the same for the blacks. And I pick up some clarity and some vibrance, and I darken down the highlights, and I brighten up a little bit of shadow detail. That's okay, but I'm kind of just working in this automated approach. Why not just click the auto button? Let Lightroom take care of it, and then I'll just print the image. I really want to stop and think about the image itself, and what can I do to emphasize the things that I like and de-emphasize the things that I don't like. Obviously, in this case, color was a big part of it. And, uh, you know, a sense of drama, certainly, but I don't want to go overboard with it either. And, frankly, I don't, in this case, want to darken down the highlights. If I lose a little bit of detail, or at least perceived detail in those bright highlights, I'm okay with that. Because, in this case, these are reflections on a canal in Venice. Bright, bright sunlight on a really colorful building. And it looks like a canal of paint. It looks... It's like the, the river itself, the canal itself, is filled with paint as opposed to water. And it really did look that way. And so I just want to emphasize and maybe even exaggerate some of that. So getting kind of inky blacks, pushing those colors up a little bit closer to where they really were, trying to get those colors to be as accurate as possible. But just trying not to fall into that trap of always applying the same adjustments in the same way. And I know, you know, even as I talk about that, there's a degree of, well, it's still the same adjustments, but being very conscious of those adjustments, the impact on the photo, and what you're trying to accomplish with the photo as well. And so in this case, for example, remember I mentioned, you're constantly trying to look at the image and figure out what is it that's not gone quite according to plan. Well, one of the things that I don't care for with this photo is that the, let's call it the bottom half, the yellow areas are a little more dingy and dark. So is there something I can do to affect that foreground? Well, a graduated filter adjustment might do just the trick. And so if I go ahead and drag an adjustment, so I've chosen my graduated filter, and then I can drag, in this case, up from the bottom. So I'm defining that gradient. I can stretch the gradient to make it go over a larger distance by dragging on the top or the bottom line there. 
I can drag on the middle line to rotate as needed, and I can click on the button to move the position of that gradient all together. In this case, notice that I've started off with a an exaggerated smooth for adjustment. I don't need that much of an adjustment, but maybe just somewhere around there, give or take. Maybe even brighten up the shadows just a little bit and give it a tiny bit more saturation to try to essentially compensate for those kind of variable, almost like variable lighting, I, I, just angle of light, angle of the reflections, I think in this case, causing those shadows to be a little darker. And so then taking a look at the effect, turning off, so I've got that light switch, so I can turn off the adjustment, turn it back on, and really just evening out those overall tones, essentially, for the image. So thinking about, you know, again, constantly trying to, I, the way I almost think about this is trying to never be finished with the photo. Every time I think I'm finished, kind of trying to step back, maybe take a break and come back to the image a little bit later and figure out, okay, what else? What else can I do to make this image even better? Uh, so, Renee, we've got another question from an attendee. Yes. Rich asks, when do you sharpen or do you not sharpen very much? Do I not? Well, I would love to say that I don't need to sharpen because every photo was so tack sharp right out of the camera. Uh, sharpening, I usually apply at the very end of my workflow in large part because once it Matter really from a technical standpoint, the order in which I apply my adjustments in Lightroom. And so I can save whatever I want for whatever stage in my workflow I feel most comfortable. And so sharpening I usually apply till later. Hopefully, because the fact that I'm working on an image usually means that I, I'm happy with the image and it usually means the image was sharp out of the camera. Sharpening in Lightroom's develop module is really focused on preserving the sharpness that got lost, or bringing back, you might say, the sharpness that got lost as part of the digital capture process. And so the anti-aliasing filter on your sensor that's aimed at reducing the risk of moiré patterns, um, the infrared cutoff filter to some extent, the actual conversion from analog to digital. So there's a variety of factors that reduce sharpness in the original image, and that the sharpening in Lightroom's develop module it's not output sharpening, it's compensating for the original. And so I'll save that for a little bit later in the workflow typically. It's usually very minimal. And in some cases, the defaults are perfectly fine, or I might even tone things down. In this case, the radius of one works fine for this image. I don't need much sharpening because this is a lot of smooth textures. I don't need fine detail. And so if there's a little loss of sharpness in the original capture, nobody's ever going to know it because frankly if I print this out everybody's probably going to assume that it was a painting in any event and so it's one of those things I saved a little bit later but keep in mind again that this is capture sharpening this is compensating for the original capture this is not output sharpening it's not sharpening for the final print for example that I prefer to Photoshop by the way um, so that's something that I save for later in the workflow and it's kind of one of those detail things we'll talk about some of those general concepts in a moment uh, but first one more question related to the overall exposure adjustment that I was working with here in Lightroom yes Renee yes Michael has this question um, do we set the monitor brightness to max or mid when adjusting the exposure what do you advise for monitor brightness monitor brightness you generally speaking I would say as a rule of thumb it's a safe bet that if you go out and buy a brand new monitor today, it is going to be a full stop too bright. It will be twice as bright as it ought to be. That can make for a beautiful, beautiful, visually stunning display, but it also means that you're seeing an image that's a bit too bright. So making some of these adjustments by eyeball can be tricky. And so you need to make sure that you're calibrating your monitor and a, a setting an appropriate luminance target value, brightness target value. I would say generally no more than about 100 candelas per square meter, which is a technical measurement of the luminance value from the monitor. That's something that the software for your monitor calibration, the Color Monkey display, for example, or the i1 Display Pro, both of those are from X-Rite. Those enable you to calibrate your display, including adjusting the overall brightness to a target value that you can specify. The default, if I remember correctly, is 120 candelas per square meter. That's, to my eye, a little bit too bright. I would aim for closer to about 100 candelas. All right, moving on. Speaking of exposure and brightness, trying to think about the image itself and you know what motivated me to stop. This actually was on a road trip. I had the bright idea of 
driving from Seattle to New York in February, in the winter time. And so uh, naturally, if you were to drive from Seattle to New York, you normally would head due east. Interstate 90 was closed at the Snoqualmie Pass for avalanche control on the day that I had decided to leave. So I headed south toward Portland and then across into Idaho and down into Utah. And I saw this scene. This is down uh, toward Ogden, somewhere between this Saint, uh, Salt Lake City and Ogden, Utah. And this actually got me to pull off of the highway and go back and backtrack and find this church, in large part because snow on the roof, the white steeple, these like inky black windows, and then the bright sky behind. It, it's just like this, talk about black and white, even though it's a color image, this, this stark contrast. And so trying to figure out, okay, how do I emphasize this? How do I bring out what really came across as this incredibly bright scene? Like almost all it was, was windows in many respects set against white, black windows set against white, so that you had this impression of a steeple even though you couldn't see it. That's obviously not literally true, but that's sort of the impression. And so trying to make sure that I'm emphasizing that, and once again, starting off with my overall white point and my overall black point, I don't want to take the sky literally to pure white. I want to have a little bit of ink on the paper in that final print, but notice that I could take that white's value up rather high. I obviously could have decided to go with the exposure adjustment initially, that would also brighten up those blacks if they're not pure black. So in this case, it's one of those six of one, half a dozen of the other type of scenarios where either approach would have worked out fine. Not that they're having the exact same effect on the image, but I could have dealt with either just fine. But frankly, in this case, just using that white slider is a little bit simpler. Same thing for those blacks. Now, this is an example of a situation where I might choose to completely get rid of those shadow details, completely silhouette as it were those windows. I almost never do that because in the final print, it's going to look pretty close to that anyway. And personally, I feel that those deep, dark, pure blacks on the paper tend to look almost like a printing mistake, almost like an error in the exposure. I'd rather have a tiny bit of detail, a tiny bit of texture or gradation in those areas so that I'm not going to have that just really pure inky black that looks like it was a printing problem, essentially. Clarity, that's a tough call in this case. I could increase clarity, more emphasize detail. I might even reduce the clarity to a negative value to get a little bit more ethereal look to that image. But in this case, certainly first, I would take a look at those highlights. And actually, a somewhat rare example of a situation where I might brighten those overall highlights. And then, you know, shadows themselves, not going to be a significant issue, but keeping in mind that if I brighten the shadows, I'm getting a little bit more contrast. So this is a situation where I actually do want to brighten up the shadows. It sounds a little contradictory because I've got my black point. I've tried to make sure that those windows stay really black. So why would I brighten the shadows? Well, those bright shadows, it's a brightening of the shadows. It's not really going to have a significant impact on the windows because they're so close to black. I will, however, now that I've brightened up the highlights, come back to my blacks, holding the alter option key and just double check. Again, one adjustment affects another adjustment. We're not affecting individual pixels, individual tonal values with no effect on any other portion of the image. And so I want to be sure to kind of revisit my adjustments. One way you might think about that is that you go through all of your adjustment sliders once, and then you come back a second time and check all of them again, just to kind of make sure. But you can see pretty straightforward in terms of the adjustments that I've applied and creating just this much more stark version of the image, almost a white sky, totally white. It's not, not completely clipped with that snow on the roof in the foreground, really lots of geometry and angles. It almost looks like a sketch drawing more than it does a photograph, I would say. Now, I also, from time to time, want to interpret an image as black and white. And in large part, my motivation there tends to be that the color is not contributing anything and it actually might be taken away. But the, I think the better way to think about this is, to me, this photo was all about tonality. Color did not even enter into the equation. Yes, there is a little bit of color. And yes, this was late afternoon. This is in Rome. 
There was wonderful shadows coming from the buildings on the left side. This is to the, the monument to Vittorio Emanuel in the center of Rome. And there's wonderful text. This was all about light and shadow and texture. The light and shadow on the top of the steps, the light, versus the face of the steps, the shadow. And then the light on the right portion of the image versus the shadows on the left. And so to me, the color's not adding anything. The texture was the exclusive reason that I captured this image in the first place. Now, I might have been working with the image and applying my typical adjustments and trying to figure out what the image needed and dark shadows. Maybe at this point I realized that I want to convert to black and white. The color's not adding anything. In this particular example, I could very easily just desaturate the image all the way to a minus 100 saturation level. But just as a matter of principle, I go to the black and white treatment option, or I'll come down to the B and W option under HSL color BW. Those are both the exact same thing. They're both just shortcuts to that black and white mode. And once we're in the black and white mode, then I can adjust the individual luminance values on a per color basis. So, Renee, there's a question about this particular image, or was that on the previous image? Nope, about this particular image. Okay. Christine asks, would this image be considered as a monochrome image? As it was originally. Yes, so coming back, is this monochromatic? Yes. And this is one of the challenges when we use the term monochromatic. Monochromatic doesn't mean black and white, it actually means one color. And so we typically make that one quote unquote color black so that we have shades of gray, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. This could be almost considered a, a sepia tone monochrome, as it were. Uh, but here I do want to go to shades of gray because that is all about tonality with no color influence at all. I could adjust the luminance values for the individual sliders here, but I'm not going to have a real big impact on the image. I'll still play with them, but for example, there's no greens really. Well, a little bit of green, a hint of green up to the top. A little bit of aqua maybe from the sky reflecting, yeah, not really. And so most of these sliders are going to have virtually no impact on the image at all, but I still like to play with them just to make sure. You never know when you're going to find some colors hidden in one little spot of the photo. You might want to light or darken that particular area. But one of the key things I want to emphasize when it comes to creating a black and white interpretation of the photo is that the color is getting stripped out, but I applied adjustments before I converted from black and white to color. Not, I didn't necessarily need to, but I chose to in this case. And so I want to make sure always, when I've applied some adjustments initially, then I go to black and white, I want to make sure that I revisit my whites, blacks, highlights, and shadows. Because you will find in many, many cases that you actually want to change the values that you're using for those specific adjustments based on having gone to black and white versus color. You've gone from having three color channels to one single black and white channel, essentially. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of revisiting, reinterpreting the image based on those considerations. Now, in other cases, you might find in this image, for example, there's a little bit more impact. I'll just go ahead and jump directly to the black and white and you find a little bit more impact in terms of the individual sliders. So I darken that down a little bit, brighten up the yellow. So the oranges I darken. Green's got basically nothing. Aqua, really nothing. A little bit of the aquas, but those I think I will brighten to get some more contrast in the foreground and kind of mid-ground area. And I'm literally just taking these sliders through their extremes, and really I'm trying to figure out contrast because. For me, this image it was a very special experience that I had when I captured this image. This is in Tokyo, Japan, and you know, I had this wonderful experience where with absolutely no language, with just kind of hand gestures, a woman brought me to the steps of a shrine and taught me how to pray at that shrine. It's a wonderful experience. I had captured this image, I thought it was going to be special, and then I wasn't really thrilled with the photo. And so I wanted to spend some time trying to figure out, okay, what about the experience was so special? What is it about the photo? And realizing there was a sense of timelessness, this sense of tradition, of history, if you will, and so trying to preserve that. Well, black and white certainly comes to mind for that purpose. Also, the textures were pretty interesting. But I felt it needed more. It needed kind of this other sense of age. And I know it's a little bit of a cliche, but I felt that by adding a little bit of a color tint 
that I, and especially a sepia tint, that I would get closer to that kind of feeling of an older, you know, a timeless quality, but with this rich sense of, of history, of tradition. And so going down into the split toning adjustments, increasing the value for saturation, overdoing it initially, because right now I'm just trying to find the color that I want to use. And I'm working with highlights, so I'll go find the color value that I want, maybe right about oh, somewhere around 50, maybe 48, 47, right about in there looks to be pretty good. I'm going to shift the balance. I don't want a shadow color. I'll go ahead and just add a shadow color so you can see I can have a different color for the highlights versus the shadows, but I don't actually want a different color. I want just one color. So I'm going to use highlights, and then I'll shift my balance all the way up to plus 100 so that only the highlights color is being applied to the entire image. And then perhaps the most important step, reducing that saturation and generally reducing the saturation somewhat significantly. So I'm down at a 12% value, for example, for saturation. But then we start getting into some of these finer details for the photo and kind of interpretive aspects, you might say. And so I want to think about some of the other adjustments that we haven't looked at so far. First off, removing chromatic aberrations under lens corrections. I pretty much want that applied to every image if I think there's any risk of chromatic aberrations. In this case, frankly, I don't think there really is much risk, but I do have some high contrast areas. It is possible. It's a relatively wide angle lens that was used. And so, um, I, you know, I, I would generally apply it. It's usually not going to be at all harmful to an image to apply the remove chromatic aberration option when there are no chromatic aberrations. I'll also enable the profile corrections and then set the auto option in order to try to make sure that I'm applying an automatic correction. In this case, somehow Lightroom got confused. It wasn't finding the right information in metadata. I specify the Canon make for the lens and then it magically figures out, oh right, from metadata, the 24 to 105. So sometimes I've seen there'll be a little bit of a fluke there where it doesn't find the right profile. I can turn off the adjustment and back on, and you see it's just compensating for the behavior of the lens. That's all well and good. Notice, though, that it, part of the behavior of the lens is actually to vignette a little bit because we're at a relatively wide-angle focal length. I actually like the vignette, but I want to apply that vignette as a post-cropping vignette. So I'll scroll down into effects. I want post-cropping. I'm not trying to correct for the behavior of the lens, and I want the post cropping vignette because it's a creative adjustment, but then also if I decide to crop the image, and I see we have a question related to cropping, which we'll come to in just a moment, but if I crop the image, I want the vignetting to follow the crop. So in this case, I want a little bit of a more dramatic vignette, so I'll set that amount to a negative value, a rather strong negative value, because I really want to frame up this image, create more of a sense of mystery, so I'll bring that midpoint in just a little bit, I'll feather a little bit more. I'm going to reduce the roundness so it gets a little more almost rectangular type of shape, maybe somewhere in there. I can turn off the effects and back on again. And again, that whole process being, what is the mood? What is it, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish for this image? And therefore, what adjustments might come to mind? Now, part of that is just my own mindset of what do I think this image needs? Part of that is becoming familiar with what adjustments are available. Part of that is just looking at other photos and seeing what sorts of effects work in particular situations. If somehow you had never seen a sepia tone image before, then browsing around different photos, finding some things you like, it might open up your eyes to some different effects that you would consider with certain images. And again, trying to make sure that you're being true to the experience of the photograph or the experience you had when you were capturing the image or the tone, the mood of the photo, whatever it is that's special about that photo to you, trying to emphasize those qualities. And you know, they, frankly, yeah. the biggest challenge is figuring out what those things are in the image. So Ray, there was a question about uh, cropping? Yeah, there was actually a couple of questions related to cropping. So how do you change the shape of a photo? How do you make it vertical? How do you crop it? Sort of, can you just address that topic? Yeah, so horizontal versus vertical in the cropping. Let's take a look. Do I an example here. Oh, probably not really. Uh, but let's just pretend that I wanted to crop an image to, well, crop in general. First off, just let's talk about cropping in general. Generally speaking, once I've selected the crop view, I'm usually going to turn off this lock icon because I don't want to lock my aspect ratio. I want to be able to crop to any aspect ratio that I want based on the actual image. 
And so I'll, generally that means I have to custom map the image, but that's okay because the image is important enough to justify that, I hope. And then I'm also paying attention to edges within the image. Is there a distraction along the edge that I need to get rid of, for example? And so just focusing on all the way around the entire level of detail in the image, the edges, the corners, every nook and cranny, trying to make sure that I'm being thoughtful about my approach to the image. And if you decide that you need to rotate the image, well, rotate the prop, I should say, to a particular vertical versus horizontal aspect ratio, that can be done as well. So for example, let's say this, obviously I'm happy with this image as a horizontal, but let's assume we want to put it on the cover of a magazine. And so I need to make it a vertical rather than a horizontal. I could choose a specific aspect ratio if I wanted to. I'll just leave that set as it is for the moment. And then I can press the letter X on the keyboard to swap between a horizontal versus vertical orientation for my crop so I can switch back and forth between a horizontal and a vertical orientation if I decided that that was important for the image or, hey, suddenly cropping the vertical becomes important when you might get a cover of a magazine, for example. So, uh, so that is uh, one option that is available in terms of just interpreting your photo. But again, just in a broader sense, being thoughtful about cropping in the context of both the overall level of detail in the image, the overall framing, the overall composition, distractions along the edges, etc. But then also recognizing that we can go to horizontal versus vertical. You can also go to, to square if you like, for example. And with especially Instagram being so popular, lots of photographers cropping to a square format, even though it's not a requirement of Instagram anymore. A lot of photographers do like, in fact, Renee herself likes the square format more than rectangular formats. Uh, and it does work. In this case, actually, it kind of works out pretty nicely for this particular photo. Um, so we have a question about destructive process right now. Yes. Is everything that you're showing today, is this all non-destructive process? Yeah, so all, everything that I'm doing in Lightroom is completely non-destructive. And what I mean by that is that my original image is not being altered. It's not that I couldn't do harm to the image. I could, for example, decide I want a high-key version of horseshoe bend, and so I cranked up my exposure by plus five stops of exposure value, of exposure compensation, you might say. Well, that's destructive in terms of the visual effect in the photo. I've lost detail, but I have not altered my original raw capture, so later when I come to my senses and decide that was not a good adjustment, I can always get back to the original version of the image. I could always, for example, just reset the image back to the way, in theory, as we talked about earlier today, uh, back to the original version as it was imported into Lightroom, you know, sort of straight out of the camera, you might say. All right, before we finish today, I do want to make sure that we talk about a basic workflow for Photoshop as well. Um, I know we've got a couple of questions, so let me cover the Photoshop aspects here, and then we'll take a couple of questions before we wrap up for today. So here's an example of a scenario where I might need to use Photoshop because of some of the limitations of Lightroom. So first and foremost, why would I use Photoshop? Generally speaking, for more advanced image cleanup, for more advanced targeted adjustments, or just for situations where I've got maybe a special filter I want to use in Photoshop, or Creative Effects, or I just feel more comfortable for whatever reason working in Photoshop for a given image. In this case, a sample image created for educational purposes only down at the bottom of the center, you might notice the shadow of my head. I was shooting with a wide angle lens with the sun essentially behind me. And for educational purposes, would you believe that I put my shadow into the frame on purpose so that I could show you how to remove it in Photoshop. If you believe that, I'm going to have to offer a special discount on Great Art. Uh, but I want to get rid of that shadow, but Lightroom, frankly, is not going to do a good job because the spot removal tool in Lightroom is just not that good when it comes to these more sophisticated adjustments. And frankly, this is an example of a situation where Photoshop's tools actually don't do that great a job either. So I'm going to take manual control over this image. The first step is to send the photo over to Photoshop. So I'll go to the photo menu and then choose edit in, followed by edit in Adobe Photoshop. So photo, edit in, followed by edit in Adobe Photoshop. Since this is a raw capture, the image will be sent you over really? to Photoshop, processed by Lightroom. And then, it, and you can see it in this case, 
Photoshop was not yet open, was not yet running, so it was launched automatically. Now I'm inside of Photoshop. So I'm just going to quickly go through these steps here and show you the basic process that I would use, and that is to create a selection. So I'll use my lasso tool and make a selection of the problem area that is larger than what I actually need. And then I'm going to move that selection. So as long as I'm on the Create New Selection option, there are four buttons. New, Add to Selection, Subtract from Selection, and Intersect with Selection. As long as I'm on that Create New Selection option, I can actually drag this selection somewhere else into the image. So maybe I bring it over here, for example. I'm choosing a sort of pixels that I think will work well for that shadow area. I'm on my background image layer. I'm going to copy pixels. I'm going to copy this grass onto a new layer. So I'll go to the layer menu and then choose to create a new layer followed by layer via copy. So layer, new, layer via copy. We can also press control J on Windows or command J on Macintosh. That will create a brand new layer. You can see layer one here. I'll switch to the move tool, letter V on the keyboard. And now I can move that layer, that extra bit of grass that I created, I can move it anywhere in the image that I like. I'll go ahead and position it right there. Looks pretty good. And then a little bit more sophisticated in theory, I could use the eraser tool, but I want to use a layer mask for added flexibility. And so I'll go ahead and add a layer mask to so a circle inside of a square icon down at the bottom of the layers panel. I'll click that to add a layer mask to my new layer, the one that I created the grass on. I'll choose my brush tool, and so I'll grab the brush tool, make sure that I'm using a soft edge brush, letter D on the keyboard for the default colors of white and black for the layer mask, and then letter X on the keyboard to switch to black, because I want to block pixels, make sure my blend mode is set to normal, my opacity is at 100%, and then I can paint to hide portions of that layer. So I'll hide the background of the layer initially here, and I can just paint to get rid of that rough edge, that crisp line from my selection, erasing around. So let's bring back the original here and blend this in a little bit more, bring that up a little bit, etc. You get the idea. I'm able to paint with black to block, white to reveal, and essentially just choosing which portions of this new grass layer are going to actually be visible. Generally, I want to use as little of those pixels as possible just to blend things in. So let's assume that that's a perfectly good correction for that shadow. Once I'm finished working in Photoshop, having sent my image from Lightroom to Photoshop, there are two steps, only two steps, precisely two specific steps that I want to use. Number one, I want to choose File, Save from the menu. That will save this image. I don't need to use Save As. I don't want to use Save As. Lightroom already created the image file for Photoshop. I don't need to save it in an additional location. I don't need to move it. I want it right where it was with the file name it had. So just File, Save, followed by File, Close. That will close the image. I can go back in to Lightroom, and now you see that the shadow has magically disappeared. I've actually created an additional version of the image. So you can see there's the raw capture with the shadow. There's the, the PSV or TIFF version, depending on my preferences settings. Not a perfect job in terms of cleaning up that shadow, obviously. I'm just trying to work quickly to demonstrate the concepts here. But again, being able to clean things up and more importantly for our purposes here today, just understanding that workflow, sending an image from Lightroom to Photoshop. And when I'm finished with that process, with whatever I need to do in Photoshop, just file save and then file close. Question, Tim. Yes. From the audience here, why wouldn't you just use Content Aware to remove that shadow? Why wouldn't I just use Content Aware? That's a really good question. The short answer is that it actually doesn't do that great a job in a situation like this where we've got this texture that I really want to try to preserve. Go ahead and zoom in here, and we'll start off, I'll just use, I won't even worry about the separate layer now, I'm just going to create a selection once again, and then go to the edit menu, followed by fill, make sure that I've got my content aware option, I can use color adaptation, and 
we'll see. I don't know how easily you'll be able to see, but if we zoom in closely here, we've got this really poor alignment between the areas that it was trying to clean up. We've got a crisp edge, so the transition is just not working. I've got this weird little blade of grass here, and another one flying out over here. Uh, so just these random little problems that it sometimes creates. So it's wonderful. Content aware is amazing for a variety of situations. This just doesn't happen to be one of them. So a particular challenge in this case, mostly I'm just showing off with a little bonus technique for something else you can use in Photoshop for cleaning up your images, for, and especially for those more tricky situations. But again, primarily I'm going to be going from Lightroom to Photoshop for situations where I know that Lightroom is just not going to be able to give me the results I need. Huh? When do you What's remove it? noise? When do I remove noise? This is I put this sort of in the same category mostly as sharpening, which is to say that generally speaking, I'll leave that noise for a little bit later in the workflow, unless the noise is really driving me crazy or I'm concerned about the setting. So in the previous webinar that I presented to PSA, there had been a question about the Milky Way. Now, I don't do a whole lot of night photography. Well, night photography I do, but astral photography, the night sky, I don't photograph all that much. So I don't have a great image of the Milky Way to share, but I can show you this one. And if we zoom in, you have that preview moment to update. But if we take a look, I mean, you can already get a good sense there. Before noise reduction, we'll let that update. There you go. Look at all that wonderful noise. Now, generally speaking, I would put noise reduction a little later in the workflow because it's just a detail thing. It's just about finalizing the image. And so I'm focused more on those sort of creative adjustments first, then let me get in and just clean up whatever nitty-gritty details I need to worry about. So noise reduction is similar. In this case, I might bring that a little closer to the beginning of my workflow just because I'm going to need to be pretty aggressive about the noise reduction, as you can see here. And I'm a little bit concerned about what the noise reduction is going to do to the stars in the sky, for example. So then I want to come revisit my overall adjustments. And so if the question yesterday was about trying to emphasize the Milky Way, and I said, you know, boosting that vibrance can help, a little bit more clarity, bringing the highlights up or down as needed, setting your white point very carefully. More importantly, perhaps, is darkening the shadows so those darker areas of the night sky get darker, and then the reasonably, relatively bright Milky Way areas get emphasized. In this case, we've got the, I think the lights of Moab maybe lighting up some of the sky as well off in the distance. Uh, but again, noise I would generally leave as sort of a detail later in my workflow. But of course, in a situation where I'm especially concerned about it, then I might bring that up toward the beginning of the workflow. So we've gone a little bit over time, but Renee, we have some additional questions from attendees today. Yes, James asks, is there any good reason to have both Lightroom and Bridge installed on my computer? <laughs> That's a tricky question. If I had my choice, I would tell photographers, if you're using Lightroom, don't have Bridge installed on your computer. I don't really mean that in terms of workflow and personal preference, but rather, I'm very concerned if you have Bridge on your computer, you're going to be tempted to update metadata to add some keywords, assign a star rating, make some changes, open up the image directly into Photoshop. You don't want to do any of those things. So if you have Bridge, I do have Bridge installed on my computer, and sometimes, especially when I'm working on images for a project that exists outside of Lightroom, I've exported images for a, a book project or an article or what have you. I'm working with those images and I want to browse them. I'll use Bridge because it's just faster and easier. So I like having Bridge plus Photoshop on the computer. I think there are situations where using Bridge is just much more convenient for just a quick browse, a quick look at the photos. But keep in mind, you do not want to make any changes to the photos at all when you're in Bridge. When you're outside of Lightroom, do not touch any metadata. Anything that you're doing to change any aspect of a photo, renaming the photo or the folder, moving the photo or the folder, changing, applying adjustments, adding keywords, changing any of the metadata, all of that should be initiated from inside of Lightroom. So with that caveat, I would say, I do prefer to have Bridge on the computer as well, but you've got to be careful in terms of those workflow considerations. Okay, so this is a question from Keith. I typically use sharpening only when I export the final JPEG image to be used in a slideshow because I do not make prints. Please comment on this use of Lightroom sharpening. Yes, yeah, so I, I would say overall that's, that's pretty well perfectly fine. 
conceptually, you might be able to get a little more detail, a little bit better results overall if you're fine-tuning the sharpening settings in the develop module. Remember, that's that capture sharpening. And then also applying some sharpening optimized for the final output, whether that's a print or whether that's for a slideshow or web gallery or what have you, a purely digital presentation of your image. What I would say is that you should still take a look at the sharpening in the develop module. Lightroom is always by default applying sharpening, a small amount of sharpening to your image. I would say in general it's a pretty safe level of sharpening. It's not likely to create any real problems for your image, but it's always a good idea just to kind of take a look and make sure that those settings are optimal. But especially for an image that's going to be presented relatively small, honestly it's going to be a rather modest, or rather small difference. So it's not something that I would worry about for purely digital displays, for online galleries and you know, slideshows and that type of thing, where you're using a low resolution version of the image in any event. But as a good practice, I would say it's a good idea to check those sharpening settings, make sure that those defaults are working for the image or fine tune as needed. Okay, additional question here. When do you make changes in Lightroom, changing the color and tone, and then import them into Photoshop? Do you lose some data in the process? All right, good question. I would say there, there are some technicalities here, but what you're sending from Lightroom to Photoshop is a rendered version of the image. So you're creating a TIFF or a Photoshop PSD file based on your original raw capture. You're preserving your original adjustments as part of that process. So you're rendering the image based on the adjustments that you've applied in Lightroom. So whatever you send over to Photoshop should look exactly like what you saw in Lightroom. There is the technicality of, well, you're rendering a RAW to a TIFF or a PSD, so there might be a little bit of loss of detail, et cetera, compared to what you might otherwise be able to produce. But those are really kind of getting down into some of the, I would call the mathematical details of the photo as opposed to those actual adjustments. And I think here the, the intent of the question is, am I keeping all of my adjustments? And the answer is yes. All of the adjustments that you see in the develop module, anything that you've applied there, when you send the image to Photoshop, that is being preserved, but bear in mind, you're creating a derivative image. You're creating a TIFF or a PSD based on that raw capture. All right, so we've run a little over time. We'll take one more question. Or you got a couple questions? You yeah. tell me. So if you wanted to get back some of that info in Photoshop, then what do you do? Uh, so, follow up to you. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So it's getting info back would be, I hopefully, just a matter of some adjustments. Let's say, for example, the shadows came out a little darker than you were expecting. You certainly could apply some adjustments in Photoshop to compensate for that. If, in theory, if you'd lost detail, if you lost blacks detail, you clipped the blacks or the highlights were blown out, that's going to be more of a challenge, but that would indicate that your adjustment was less than ideal in terms of those Lightroom adjustments. But yes, as a rule, what you're sending from Lightroom to Photoshop is going to be an accurate reflection of what you had inside of Lightroom. If you're seeing any obvious visual changes, that would be an indication. That, for example, maybe check your color settings in Photoshop. Maybe there's a conversion there that's happening that is not ideal. Uh, for example, I would generally want to use ProPhoto RGB as my color space for that type of workflow. Okay, two really quick questions <laughs> that are related to the lenses that you use. Right. What lens did you use to take a photo at Horseshoe Bend? Uh, the lens at Horseshoe Bend. Oh, now I have to remember. I'm pretty sure that was a 10 to 22. Yeah, it must have been because that's a real wide view. So yeah, that's a 10 to 22, but on a crop sensor. So this is the equivalent of a 16 millimeter focal length uh, you do have to get right up to the edge to be able to see the river. So a lot, of, a lot of photographers miss this shot because they don't want to go anywhere near that thousand foot drop. But this is an equivalent focal length of 16 millimeter relative to 35 millimeter format. But uh, specifically a 10 millimeter, a 10 to 22 millimeter Canon lens on a crop sensor that has 1.6 cropping factor. Okay, and the second lens question is, what lens would you normally use in the little astrophotography so generally speaking, I'm using a 24 to 105 millimeter lens for astrophotography, sky photography. In large part, I generally want a relatively wide angle view. There obviously there's all sorts of you know variations on the theme here that you might consider, but for astrophotography, generally relatively wide angle, trying to make sure I've got some sort of interesting foreground element ideally. That wide angle lets me take a longer exposure without having to worry about the star trails, assuming I don't want star trails in that particular photo. Obviously, we could go the other direction if we want star trails and have a longer exposure. Uh, and so generally speaking, relatively wide, but not super wide. So with Horseshoe Bend here, I'm at uh, 
16 millimeter equivalent focal length or 10 millimeter lens on a crop sensor because I'm trying to include a big wide view. But the sky, I don't want to become extra diminutive relative to foreground subjects, and so I'm usually not going to want to shoot too extremely wide. And so 24 to 105 is my kind of standard lens of choice in that context. Quite frankly, that 24 to 105, for me personally, is one of the lenses that I use the most in many, many situations, just because I do a lot of photography where I'm able to get reasonably close to my subjects, and so I don't need the extra reach. And the 24, yeah, usually works out pretty well, but I've got a handful of lenses that let me go to a wider view as needed. And, uh, you know, obviously there's situations where I need a longer lens. I do bird photography periodically, 24 to 105, not usually going to help me out too much with bird photography. So it just depends on the circumstances, uh, what I'm photographing, where I am, what I'm going to be doing. But uh, generally speaking, that 24 to 105, that is the lens. That's my default lens. When in, when in doubt, that's the lens that's probably going to be on my camera. All right, so thank you all so very much for joining today. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, first off, be sure to check your email inbox later on tonight. It'll probably be at least a few hours because we're gonna produce a video recording of this webinar so that you can watch the webinar again later if you'd like. I know, I was probably talking way too fast, trying to cover a lot of material for you. So with the video, you'll be able to pause and rewind as needed. And so it'll be a little bit later because we do have to process that recording and render the recording and upload the recording. Some time will be involved, but later on this evening, check your email inbox. And if you don't have it by tomorrow morning, feel free to send me an email, tim at timgray.com, and we'll get you taken care of in terms of access to that video recording. Also included with that very same email, you will have information on how you can access a completely free video training course. It's not a course that's always free. It's a course that we're giving to you as a thank you for attending the webinar and to give you a chance to check out the Gray Learning Video Training Library, which has got dozens and dozens of courses, hundreds of lessons, lots of content, all aimed at different aspects of your photographic workflow from photography in the field to Lightroom, Photoshop, and more. And so this will give you a good chance to get a sense. The course is Understanding Lightroom. It's aimed at helping you better understand exactly how Lightroom works. So check your email inbox later on tonight for info both on accessing the video recording and also that free video training course. If you've had so much fun today that you just can't wait to sign up for a Gray Learning Everything bundle that includes all of the video courses that we produce ourselves along with Pixology Magazine and a whole lot more, you can check out that bundle at timgray.me slash PSA bundle. And so be sure to check that out. But again, we'll include that info in a follow-up email as well. So I want to thank you once again for joining me for today's webinar. And thank you again to PSA for hosting for this webinar. It's been lots of fun. I hope you found it incredibly educational and maybe a little bit entertaining as well. And we'll hope to see you on a future Gray Learning webinar. Thank you very much.